hey gamers, this is Liz Davidson from Beyond Solitaire, and we're going to do a how to solo of Final Girl. This is a new game from Van Ryder Games. It uses the hostage negotiator engine to power a game about the conflict between a final girl and a terrible murderer. This is only partially set up because y'all are going to roll with me to figure out which killer and which setting we are going to be playing in. But this is the basic setup for the final girl herself. So I randomly drew and got Asami. There are a whole bunch of different final girls to choose from. So I was basically just shuffling these and seeing who I got. Essentially, you'll get two final girls per feature film box that you buy. In order to play this game, you need the core box. So this is mostly stuff from the core box. And then you'll also need a feature film box to have a complete game. So the feature films each include a killer and a setting. I have them all, so I'm going to roll the random setting dice and see what happens. For now, what's going on is this is our card market. Here's our starting hand of action cards. You know that they're the ones you start with because they cost you zero time. Here are some health tokens that we're going to finish using in a moment and then put aside. But basically, Asami has five health. She's got four hearts, and then I have put this mysterious final health token here. Maybe if she dies, it will have an extra health under it, and maybe it won't. We don't know. I've got her card, and we've got our dice. But we're going to roll some special dice to figure out what to set up next. I got a nice Kickstarter bundle of this game that came with a Necronomicon. And the Necronomicon has dice in it that will tell you, based on the faces, what killer and what setting we're going to be playing with. So let's find out, shall we? Let's open the Necronomicon. We won't be reading it aloud. I'm not here for that. Let's take these two dice and see what we get. Okay, so we're going to fight the Poltergeist, and we're going to do it on Maple Lane. So those are from two different boxes. So I'm going to get those set up and we're going to we're going to see what happens. <laughs> so now we're all set up for the fun of the poltergeist on Maple Lane. Uh, I've got our poltergeist set up. Normally there would be a health meter over here, but the poltergeist is special. You can't actually do any damage to her. So all of your attack cards, they can sometimes be used against your terror cards, but you're not going to be attacking this particular enemy. She can attack you though. So don't get don't get too comfortable. Her horror meter is going to start on three, so we're going to put the meeple right here. Basically, our horror level controls how many dice we are able to roll on a given turn. So get too freaked out, you're down to one die. Get comfortable, you're up to three. We've also given her a dark power card that we, it's randomized. She has several, so we don't know what one it is. And same thing with this final power. So basically, she will upgrade at the very end if we run out of terror cards. This is her bloodlust meter, and it's telling us how far she can move and how hard she can hit us. It's going to go up as she kills more people because that's very exciting for her. Or maybe she's just stressed because we are both on the search for someone very special. Uh, we can't attack her, so the only way to win this scenario is to find a little girl named Carolyn, you know, Carol Ann, and get her out of one of the exit spaces on this board. So hidden somewhere in these item decks is Carol Ann. And we're going to have to find her and get her out of here before we are dead. There are four exit spaces on the board. So basically at the ends of Maple Lane intersection. And this actually be interesting because there's some special rules for searching and everything else on this particular neighborhood as well. So what's going to make the searching of Maple Lane extra unusual is that it is a neighborhood instead of just a series of interconnected locations. And the rules have changed to reflect that. So normally you'll have three locations on a map that allow you to search and you just go in there and you search like the attic or, you know, there's a shed in Camp Happy Trails. In Maple Lane, you have four search piles instead of three and they are divided by quadrant. So you have Northwest, Southwest, Northeast and Southeast. And the thing is, once you've searched a house successfully and you've got an item off of the, you know, the item stack in there, you can't search that house anymore. So like, I'm actually thinking about making a run up to here, like my boyfriend's house. Gotta have a boyfriend's house, right? Um, but once I've successfully searched here, I can't search here again. I'm gonna have to go to different houses in the quadrant in order to get through the search stack. And the further complication for that is that, um, the people on this street are completely freaked out by what's going on. And you have to use a special action called convince to get them to let you in the house. So I can search these pretty easy, but if I need to get into these houses that have actual people in them, I'm going to have to actually buy a card called convince 
and I'm going to have to roll successfully to get in. And so it's going to be a pretty rough go potentially as I'm searching through all these decks to try to find Carolyn. So this could work really easy if I like find her and then manage to get to an exit right away. So maybe I'll luck out, but this could also turn into a complete cluster as I'm trying to find this girl and trying to get into these houses, all these people, but the poltergeist is also chasing me. This could be pretty wild. So I'm actually kind of excited about it because if I die gloriously, you'll get a good laugh and so will I. Um, and if not, it'll be exciting. So one super positive thing I have to say about this game is just that no matter how the game goes, it's still fun. And I feel like that, that, that says a lot for this game. It's nice. All right, so there's one more thing we need to do before we officially start to play, and that is draw an event from up here. Events are triggered by the terror deck, but you start with one. So let's see what we get. Aw. We got, all right, so this is Officer Cop. Basically, we put him at one exit. He'll proceed one space each upkeep round to the other exit and victims who are with him will follow him and they're considered safe when they get to the exit. So that's actually really cute. So the question is, where do we put Officer Cop? So most of these victims, even if you get them to an exit space, they won't actually go out the exit space unless you make them. So having somebody else to help us with that Officer Cop would be great. So the question is, where do we put Officer Cop? Um, the poltergeist is right here and she tends to target victims that are nearest to her. So I'm not totally sure it's worth putting Officer Cop over here just to walk through a bunch of people that she's gonna mow down. At the same time, if these people panic and flee out in the street or something, Officer Cop might pick them up on the way out. So I think what I'm gonna do, yeah, let's put this here and hope that he just kind of quietly drives across town and the poltergeist leaves him somewhat alone. We'll see. All right, so now it's my turn and uh, let's see what happens. So we're gonna walk through a turn and how it works. We're gonna start with the action phase and that means that I'm gonna play my action cards. I only have zero card, I only have zero time count cards now. This is like my free opening hand, but I'm gonna have to budget my time anyway because a lot of these things cost time, that red hourglass and I need time to purchase stuff, including the convince and search cards I'm going to absolutely need to get stuff from these houses. So we're just gonna have to do our best here. So my opening hand starts with, I get two walks. So it's just basic movement. Two focus cards, they lower your horror and maybe buy you a little time. Short rest for if you hurt, which I will be at some point. And a weak attack where you just kind of like, eh, it's someone, it's not, not a lot. So I can't attack the poltergeist, but occasionally things will come out of the terror deck that I can. Uh, the, I'm hoping to not have to do too much attack card planning at all in here. Let's, let's get through this with minimal violence, shall we? Except that I know that the poltergeist won't let me let that happen. So I think what I wanna do is these people are right by this poltergeist and they're in, in, they're in pretty immediate danger. At the same time, I know that the poltergeist is going to go for these people first because they are like she'll pick the space that has more people in it before she picks the space that has fewer and so my temptation is to well the other problem is that i can't get in here yet because i need an action turn in order to um in order to get in here and save these people i think what i might do is maybe try to grab these people come back here, maybe get some of these people out of the house and search it on the next turn. And just kind of like make a plan. So basically um, I'm gonna try to get some victims out of here before the poltergeist gets this way. And then I'm gonna search maybe the north quadrants and then the south ones. Or I could search here and here, but the things, yeah, I just don't actually know where Carolyn is. So I could waste a lot of time trying to find her. So that's, that's a toughie. The other thing is that there's a lot of easy free searching going on up here without me having to convince anyone. I can just move into houses that don't have people. So I think I might take these people up here and do a little bit of searching and then try to come around and do some convincing. That may be the best. Okay, so that's my basic strategy outlined. And then the question is, do I wanna focus or do I wanna walk first? Um, if I focus, I can buy myself a little bit of time and bring my horror level down, which is not bad. Uh, but if I fail at that, I'm just wasting time and losing cards. 
So every card in here has three types of result, super success, success, and failure. Failures are really bad. So courting them with no need is always like kind of a questionable choice. I don't really think that both of my focus cards are gonna work enough to get my horror down to one. So I'm gonna walk first and then maybe spend some focus if that seems like a good idea. But I can also just dump it to create walking success. All right, so let's start by walking. I'm gonna roll two dice and we're gonna see how successful I am. Okay, so I got one success and I got one partial success. And the question is, do I want to turn this success into, do I want to turn this partial success into one? I think I'm gonna do that actually. Let's dump my weak attack and short rest cards, which I don't need yet. So we'll discard them with this walk in order to move up to two spaces instead of just one, because I want, I want this movement. I really, really do. So that'll cost me a time. And I'm going to go like this. One, two. So basically what that's going to do for me is I've carried two of these victims with me. Um, essentially victims will follow you only two of them at a time, but they'll follow you anywhere except into the space with a killer because that's too scary. But other than that, you can kind of herd them around. They're not the smartest, but you know, you, you can at least exert your influence upon them once you get in their house, that is. All right, so let's try another walk. Okay, so we had another situation where we have this success and then a partial. So the question is, do I want to spend my focus cards on turning this into two successes and moving two spaces? Actually, this time I don't because I know that Asami has a couple of little benefits on here and um, I want to use that one of them is move an extra space. So I'm just going to be efficient with her and do some movement instead. So I'm going to do lose my one time. I'm going to move one. And then I can actually choose to save these victims now because we've entered an exit space. So these green spaces at the edges are exits. I can save both of these people, which is really great. So I'm going to use one of them to take a search action card because that's important to me right now and I want one for free. So that just goes right into my hand. Then I'm going to use move one space to go into one of these neighboring houses. And the question is which one I might choose to start over here because I can just search these two houses out because I, you know, I can try at least to get, there's only three things in each of these decks. So if I can get successes on these searches, I can search these two houses out, start moving away from the poltergeist and towards these people that I can save. And I don't have to go spending convinced cards just yet. So I think I'm going to move in here. All right. So I actually do have enough time to play that search card and may choose to do so. All right. So I'm going to go ahead and play this search card. Good thing I didn't spend my focus is my foci. I don't know. All right, please don't let this go bad. All right, so if I have a successful search, I can take the top two items out of my space and choose one, and the other one goes like on top face up or underneath face down, or I can take the top item card of my space. If I fail, things get real bad. So let's not, just don't, don't fail, Asami. Don't suck at this. Okay, well, we got one success and then one failure. So I could take the top item at least. So at least I can get these odds and ends because this is the Northwest quadrant. So let's see what we have. If you're in a house, you may place a booby trap token in it. If an enemy moves into there, discard the token and the enemy takes two. So like, this is not the most useful because we are fighting a poltergeist who doesn't, he's, she's not susceptible to booby traps, but we'll just put her in our backpack because why not? The point was to get through the search deck. Okay. So I have these two focus cards. I could try to lower my horror rating, but I actually don't necessarily want to do that. I think I'm going to stop because I want to buy some cards and I still have this time left. I spent one on the search. So I only have three time left and I don't want to waste any more of it on actions when I need to purchase search cards because yeah, that's, it's just not an option not to have that. So now we are going to say that we are done with our action phase. Everything looks right. Yeah. We're going to move into our planning phase. So I'm going to hold these cards to the side for a moment because I can't buy these back this turn. If I use it this turn, I can't buy it back next immediately. 
So I have these two focus cards in my hand, they're gonna hang out, and then I can purchase three points worth of cards from over here. So I know what I want. I wanna search, and I want, I think I want a, I don't need to convince anybody just yet, I will want that, but I'm gonna take a close call. So that's three points spent and may it serve me well. <laughs> All right, so that's my planning phase. Now we get to the fun part. We're gonna be in the killer phase. So the killer gets to do her stuff. I'm gonna put these back on the market first cause I always get sloppy with that and then I feel bad because it's hard to track. So this search goes back on the market. These zero point cards go back and I'll probably just pick them up at the end of my next planning phase. All right, so now the poltergeist gets her turn to do some dirty deeds. So she's gonna move. Well, she's gonna target first, then she's gonna move, and then she's gonna attack. So up here you have her action. So she's gonna target either the final girl or victim, whoever's closest, that's what that yellow symbol means. The boot means she's gonna move. She can move up to two right now based on her bloodlust meter. And then she's going to stab someone because that's just her thing. So here she is, she's gonna target the place that has the most victims that is nearest to her. So that's the Smalley's house. Sorry, Smalley family, it's a rough one. So she's gonna go in here. She's going to stab one of them. She could move up to two, but why? Why move extra when there's just juicy people to kill right there? A victim has died. I'll just put them here. Well, I'll put them off to the side. But yeah, this is, uh, this is rough because the bloodlust meter is gonna go up. That means that my horror meter is also gonna go up. And of course, if I get too freaked out, it, it reduces the number of dice I can roll. So this is a little scary. You know, we gotta keep this under control as much as we can. And she's not done. So she did her killer action, but now she's gonna do a terror card and let's just see what's on it. Oh God, everything was flying around. Place the poltergeist with the closest victim or in your space if there are no victims. Stabby, stab, stab. Okay. So essentially you do the card in order. At the top, I see the horror track sign. So my horror goes up by one. I'm gonna to need to do something about this next turn. No question. I would move her, but I won't because she's already with victims and then she's gonna stab someone. Great. So it's another victim dead. Another bloodlust increased and it's gonna reveal her dark power. Crap, that was quick. <laughs> So it's dark power time. Which dark power did we get? Okay, so we got eternal despair. And what this one says is whenever you resolve a horror roll, lose time for every one showing on a die after rerolls. So basically if I roll really low, like a one, I have to um, lose time over it. Time which I should decrease back to six because that's what I'll have for next round. So that is rough, but we are done for now with her. So it's gonna be back to me shortly. After she's gone, we do what's called the panic phase. If someone has died this turn, did that happen? Yes, it did. Uh, if there is a victim in a space with the killer, they are going to roll to see where they go in panic. So basically this one to three is to come into the house. So. The way that I'm gonna play this is that if I roll a one to three, the victim will foolishly stay in the house convincing themselves everything is okay. If I roll a four to a six, they're gonna run out into the street. So let's see what we do. All right, so we got a five. They're gonna run out into the street. Oh my God, this is terrible. The people are dead in my house. Ah! Okay, so next we have our upkeep phase. This person is probably not gonna make it because <laughs> The poltergeist is just gonna come kill them. Um, but officer, officer Cobb is gonna appear because it's upkeep. So he's gonna like be like, oh, what's the problem, ma'am? How can I assist you? You look terrified. She's like, there's two dead people in my house. Are you sure you didn't do it? No, it was a ghost. I believe you, let me take you out of town. Uh, so now this person is like with the cop. If the cop manages to move with them out of the neighborhood, uh, then they'll escape. But I don't know that that's gonna happen because if the targeting for the poltergeist is to go to the nearest victim, that's still them. There's nothing on the event about whether they kill Officer Cop though. So I guess he'll just leave with some job related trauma, but we'll see how that plays out. It's back to me for now. So I have these cards, hooray. So I think the first thing I'm gonna do, oh, I just realized something. 
I knew this and then I forgot, which is what happens when you aren't playing games with special rules. Okay, so I actually can't search here. Again, I was thinking that I could because normally you can just search locations again and again, but Maple Lane has special rules. So we're gonna retcon just a little bit. Instead of this search for two, let's say that I bought a sprint instead because that's what I would have bought if I'd been planning just a little bit better because I need to get to another building. So I think what I'm gonna do is try to move. So um, I can't actually do any search actions until I am in a different house because that's the way that the Maple Lane special rules work. I was thinking previous settings, but no. Okay, so the question is, do I run across the street to my boyfriend's house? Or do I run like down and into this one and keep searching this stack? The good thing is actually, I, was, I had been worried about like keeping track of where I'd search, but I actually like that I can um, go from house to house. Okay, I am going to not get too close to this poltergeist. <laughs> I'm going to jet across the street to my boyfriend's house if the sprint will let me. Just because I think that the boyfriend's house is thematically fun and I can joke about being there. So let's do that. Let's play a sprint. It'll let me move up to three spaces if successful, two if I have one success. Just please don't let me have no successes. I would suck. All right. So scarily, I got a partial success and a failure, but we can't do that. So we're going to do a close call. We're going to roll any one die. So we're going to take this two and hope that I get a success. All right. So we got a five and that will do pig. Okay. So this, I didn't spend any time on it, but it's discarded. This is going to cost me one time to move up to two spaces. So I'm just going to go to do across the street to my boyfriend's house because obviously that's where you hang out. Let's see if he's been stashing a little girl in his house because that's not creepy thematically, um, but we're just gonna pretend that he's babysitting here or something or she's in there. All right, so focus. Um, I'm gonna do one because I would like to get my horror roll a little bit back under control because this is scary. And also I could get to get a little bit of more time to buy stuff, which I think seems smart. So let's see how we do on that. Okay, so I lost a time, but I did decrease my horror by one. Let's do the other one too, because I just cannot get bumped up into here. Okay, so once again, unfortunately, I do lose a time, but I do also get to lower the horror by one. So just trying to keep this under control, because if we don't, it's going to be problematic, shall we say. All right, so now we're in the planning phase. I'm going to leave these over here. I've got three time left. I'm going to take all my zero cards back. Yes, yes. Then I'm going to spin two on a search card and one on, let's say the other close call. Okay. Then these will go back on the market for next time. So these are my just zeros, my sprint and my close call. Okay. I'm all set. I did my actions. We'll go back up to six time. I did my planning. Now it's time for this bee to get back into action. All right, so her first thing is she's gonna do her killer action. So she's gonna target the nearest me or victim. It's gonna be a victim. She's gonna move and she's going to stab. So she's gonna come here. And then she is going to kill this uh, civilian right in front of a police officer. I guess she's not worried about being arrested. So off this person goes, her bloodlust goes up and the officer's like, what the heck just happened? Oh my God. This person, like, I don't know, gets thrown into his windshield, something just horrific because obviously this is the poltergeist of Maple Lane. Um, so <laughs> poor officer cop, he didn't sign up for this, but there's nothing in the, um, in the event card that indicates that he's a victim or that he dies. So I'm just going to assume that weird crap happens in front of him. And he's like, oh God, oh God, oh God. And just keeps driving straight through the neighborhood. Now we're gonna draw a terror card. Oh my God. Corporeal form. A behemoth appears. You may play action cards that inflict damage if you wish. Then if the behemoth is still alive, you take one damage equal to the killer's attack value plus one you may defend as normal. If you take damage, discard an item of your choice, the behemoth disappears. Well, damn. Okay. 
I can't defend against this guy. He's got two health and I only have a weak attack for one. So I'm not even going to be able to do anything. So basically I'm like sneaking to my boyfriend's house. Like, I don't know, wishing he was there for the moral support, I guess. And then rah, behemoth appears and I'm like, whoa, that's not my boyfriend. And he is going to hit me for one, two, one, two. So I'm just getting two health knocked off right away. Because the killer can hit me for one. Plus one is two. So I got slapped by this behemoth. And then if I take damage, I discard an item of my choice. So these odds and ends will just go away. And then the behemoth whoo, disappears. That sucked. <laughs> oh God. <laughs> okay then. So that was the whole terror phase though. So at least it's over, I guess. Um, so here I'm at my boyfriend's house and we're certainly going to search it. I have one search card. If I can, get a great roll I can get two items but otherwise I have to um call it done so that sucks so I do have some stuff I can discard I can re-roll I don't even know if Caroline's in this pile okay all right so this was really bad um, I'm trying to search and I got a partial success and a two so let's spin the close call I'm gonna reroll one or two. I'm gonna reroll both. Oh, that was vicious. Okay, well that sucked. I rolled two partial successes. I'm gonna have to give up two cards. Um, God, I hope I don't have to heal again soon. We're gonna do our short rest and weak attack to convert one of these to success because we have to search. We can't waste this time. So, I mean, I guess I get the top item on the, the stack. I got a Bible. Oh, hey, it's plus two dice when I'm resolving a convince action card. So at least it'll make it easy for me to get to the next person's house. I guess thematically it's like, oh, I am a woman of the Lord. You can trust me. I can maybe even exercise the poltergeist for you. Let me in. Because religious people are always safe in horror movies. It'll go great. All right, so now I have these two walks and I guess we better spend them. Okay, so I'm gonna spend one at least to start walking and I want to walk I guess here this is probably the best because I don't have to spend a convince to get in here and it's still less distance than getting in here okay oh my lord okay well that sucked because I got a success so I do get to walk but I also got one failure which cost me a time because of the eternal despair uh ghost power so I'm going to walk out here and then I'm going to have to continue walking. Uh, also, my boyfriend's house has been searched, so I can't search there again. Yikes. All right. And then this other walk, because it spent me a time. I spent a time on the walking too. So I only have two time left. I'm going to hold on to this walk card because I need to be able to move in next in coming turns as well. And I'm going to need to buy other cards than movement. Shoot. Okay, so this is this is gonna be a tense one. I only have like two points to spend. Let's do, okay. So the thing is I'm gonna have to move before I can do anything else. So the question is, do I try to get two successes on this walk and just pray? Do I get a sprint? Uh, I'm like rhythmically off on this. Okay, I'm definitely gonna take both focus cards. But the question is how am I gonna spend my other stuff? Um, okay, since I only have two cards, um, and I do get an extra convince die on my next convince roll. Okay, I'm actually gonna, ooh, this is awkward because I really need, I, I'm just not generating enough move. Okay, here's what I might do. I'm gonna buy a sprint card because I just don't know if I can move enough. And I'm actually gonna move over this way instead and try to convince my way in rather than come right in here because it just, I can spend the cards to kind of get over in this area. I don't know, maybe that's irrational, but I mean, all gamers are right. We just like to pretend we're not. Okay. All right. So for better or for worse, I picked up the sprint card, hoping that I can get some movement going and maybe I can come over here and convince these people on a future turn. The problem is no matter what, I'm going to be kind of stuck out in the middle of the street. For now though, our poltergeist is going to move and she's again going to target the nearest victim, not me because I'm too far away from her right now, which is frankly good. Okay. So... She's going to target one of these people. She's equidistant from them. So 
I'm just gonna roll. Let's say that she's gonna roll on a one to three, she'll go up here. On a four to six, she'll go down here. Okay, so it was a three, she'll go here. Hello. So she can move two, so this was no problem. She was able to go one, two. So this person died, and that sucked because it bumped my horror up by two. Shiza. Okay. Now we have a tarot card. Carolyn, where are you? If Carolyn is not with you, discard and draw the next tarot card. Okay, so basically if I had Carolyn with me, this card can force me to shove her back into an item deck and go looking for her. So thank God that wasn't the case. But I do have to draw another tarot card and burning through that's bad too. All right, so what are we going to get this time? They just got hit by a car. If there are no victims in any street spaces, discard and draw another tarot card. Oh, great. So we're just burning through everything. Crap. Okay. They told us to hide. Okay, so this one is gonna make our horror go up by one. I guess it's a good thing I got a couple focus cards, damn. All right, so we're gonna place one new victim in each house that's not connected to an exit. So basically the two houses in the end of every, so basically it's these central houses, exit, 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 exit. So this one is not, so we'll put somebody here. We'll put somebody here. We'll put somebody here. And this house is getting awful full over here. But everybody else's house is in fact connected to an exit. And then we're gonna do an event. Uh-oh, so let's find out about the event. So Officer Cop doesn't get canceled or anything. Events can just kind of continue to pile up. So no worries about Officer Cop. He'll still be here to help us if he can. What is going on over there? Place one new victim on each exit. Okay. So we're gonna place one new victim on each exit. So one, two, hey, this worked out. Three, four. Okay then. Okay, okay, so here's what we're gonna do then. We're definitely gonna save this victim. If we can get over here and save that one, then we actually uh, have better search capabilities. So that's worth considering. The other thing is it's good I didn't bank on being able to get in here without a convince card because uh, yeah, that wouldn't have happened because now there's a person in it. All right, so that was the entire terror phase. It was in fact terrible. Also, I'm pretty sure I need to move my horror meter up one more, which is really bad. So I'm down to one die, crap. Okay, so here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna play our focus cards first. I'm at six time, by the way, at the beginning of my round. All right, so we're playing this one. Okay, well, at least we got a success there. So whew, time spent, but time well spent. Let's focus again, because we've got to do something about this horror situation. I get to roll two dice this time, so at least there's that. Oh, yes, okay, so we got two success. This is actually fantastic, because our horror goes down, and we actually gain two time back instead of losing some. Okay, so this is still not ideal, but we're, we're working with it here. That was a good success right when I needed one. Now let's move. Let's start with our walk. Okay, so we got one success at least. By the way, before I walk, I'm gonna go and knock this person off of the track. They've exited and the reward here is reduce horror by two. So I'm gonna go ahead and bring it down some more. Gotta keep that under control because otherwise we are in deep trouble. Then I can move one. So I'm gonna walk here. I'm gonna play my sprint. That's gonna cost me a time, by the way, for the walk. Actually, I'm off of my time. Let's calculate that. So I had six to start. I went down for my first focus, up two for my second one. There we go. And now the walk, I'm back at six. Sorry about that. I get so excited when I'm playing. I just totally like mess up time sometimes. So forgive me. Uh, and then we have a sprint. Okay, that's not bad. I actually get to move two spaces. So let's do one, two. And what we're gonna do is the next turn, we're maybe gonna come in here and try to convince people to let us in. And then, sorry, I'm losing time. And then we're gonna maybe try to save some people at this exit. That seems good. Okay, I have five left, because I went up, then back down to six, then back down to five for my sprint. Now I have five points to spend, and that is not bad, my friends. So here were the cards that I had last time that I did not buy. 
these are the ones that are off the market for this turn. Okay, so I'm definitely taking all these zero ones, including the walk, that'll be nice. Okay, I have five points to spend. Let's get a search. Let's get a convince. Maybe another convince. And a close call. Okay, yes, I think that's what we're gonna do this time. So I've got like a nice fat hand with some stuff I can ditch if I have to. So I'll take that, I'll take that. All right, so now we're on a terror turn. Let's see how this goes, kids. All right, so the ghost is gonna do her thing. First, who was our closest victim? The one who just walked into the freaking exit. So she's gonna be like, ah, this victim is gone. Um, the terror bloodlust meter goes up. She can move three now. So she can move up to three spaces. So this is gonna make her a little scarier. But at least our horror didn't go up or anything. So now we're gonna have a terror card and let's see what's on that. Oh, oh my God. Okay, I said, don't look back. If there are no exits that have at least one victim, although we do have those, um, draw, draw, discard and draw the next terror card. Otherwise we're gonna place the killer on any one exit that has a victim. So I'm gonna go for this one. So sorry, victim down here. We're gonna put you down here with the killer. That sucks. And then there will be a targeting and a stabbing. So this person died, yet another person died, and our ghost has some more bloodlust. This is getting really out of hand. Oh gosh. But we made it. We made it through the terror phase. Whew. Officer Cop. I think he's behind. He was supposed to move last turn too. And now we're in upkeep, so he's gonna move again. What's up, Officer Cop? He might bail this person the exit out for me. So that'll be good. Okay, so that was upkeep. Everything's cleaned up. Okay, now it's back to me. Okay, so let's uh let's try to convince action to get into this house. Especially because I can take the top item. Oh shoot, I don't know if I want to do that part. Maybe I just want a partial success on the convince so I can spend a search and try to get both items. This is rough, guys. Or, you know, we'll just we're just gonna have to do it. I'm just gonna have to get through these. I'm gonna have to get through all this stuff somehow. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll suck it up. Okay, so I have two dice. For this convince roll, I'm gonna use my Bible to, uh, let's, I guess it has to be my hand, I don't know. It doesn't have a hand on it. I think it's okay here. Okay, so um, I'm gonna take two dice. So because of my Bible, I get plus two dice when I'm resolving a convince action card. All right, so I'm in the youth group. I'm so good, you can trust me. I know all the hymns. What a friend we have in Jesus. What a friend we do not have in Jesus, that was trash. All right, but I did get inside. So um, we are going to enter an adjacent house and lose one time. I am starting at six time. So we'll come in here. Hey everyone. Okay, so we'll lose some time, but I do have a search card, which I'm going to use right now. I'm gonna use the search card. Okay. Please let me be successful. All right, so I get two dice. Oh, they were both partial successes, crap. I need to spend some cards though on this. So actually, ooh, I could use my close call, but I don't want to just yet. I'm gonna use my weak attack and my short rest to guarantee this success. Then we're gonna take an item. <gasps> yes! Oh my gosh, it's Carolyn. Guys, it's Carolyn, we found Carolyn. Okay, so we're gonna hold her little hand. She has to go in your hand. This one doesn't have any hands on it, so which is why I assume it's fine in my backpack. Um, yes, okay, so we get the, we need to get the heck out of here. We need to get the heck out of here. Uh, so that cost me some time to do that search. Yeah, time is correct right now. Ooh, okay, I only have a walk though. Oh, shoot. Okay, if I get two successes on this walk, I'm gonna be able to lose two spaces. I could win right now. Or I'm gonna roll really bad and it's gonna be a disaster. <gasps> yes! Oh my God, I got two successes. Okay, so I'm gonna take two people with me. They'll follow. One, two, 
and we're gonna get all these people off the map, but also I made it to an exit space <gasps> with Carolyn. Whew. Okay, so that was a lucky win. This could have really gone either way because I did not know where Carolyn was. Basically, if she had not been there, I would have had to keep searching and this game would have continued. So I can see Carolyn Polterdyke. So I can see Poltergeist at Maple Lane being something that turns out if you get a lucky search. But really, really could go bad if you get an unlucky search, especially because you have to go into all the houses and there might be people in them. All right, so that was wild. Poor Officer Cop, he didn't get to save anyone. But that's okay. I'm going to just be really happy that worked out. All right, so that was a slightly anticlimactic ending. The last time I played the Poltergeist, I was like literally running out the door with one health left and she was scaring me. So <laughs> you just don't know what you're going to get when you play this game. <laughs> but I think that that's part of the fun of it. The reason this game delights me every time is that it's just, it's such a quick play, actually, when you're not talking, which I was. Um, <laughs> but um, it's also really nice because you just never really know how things are going to turn out. And so every game has like a different vibe to it, even if it's the same setting with the same killer. So hopefully that'll give you a good overview of how to play this game. I'm kind of sorry I won because sometimes like the losses are way more exciting actually. But uh, you know, I'm also not unhappy that my systematic like house searching worked. So there you go. Thanks so much for watching. I really do recommend Final Girl. My review of it came out earlier this week. Uh, please do like, comment, subscribe to the channel, and most of all, happy gaming.